Hi, everyone. Good evening, and thank you for coming to the grant making workshop in our Learn with Noma series. Uh, as Michelle indicated, my name is Nuria Leva Gutierrez, and I'm the executive director of Noma. Um, before we begin tonight, I'd like to thank the New York State Council on the Arts for supporting our program. This workshop tonight will include a presentation followed by a Q&A. So feel free to prepare any questions you might have for that portion of the evening. We have a lot of material for you tonight. And so I'd like to get started right away. Uh, but first I am pleased to introduce our expert. Michael J. Palma is a lifelong resident of Hamilton Heights in West Harlem. He earned his BA in English from Columbia University and his MFA from the Oscar Hammerstein's second Center for Theater Studies, also at Columbia University. He currently serves as executive director of Teatro Circulo and has worked in Latino theater for the past 20 years and in the areas of finance, fundraising, and the management of capital acquisitions. He has also produced and presented Spanish language classic and contemporary dramas for the Puerto Rican Traveling Theater, INTAR, and Teatro Stage Fest. Michael is also a photographer documenting the cultural life in Upper Manhattan, where he has also curated and participated in various photography exhibitions. As a community activist, he is focused on improving West Harlem's quality of life and affordable housing and serves as a volunteer leader of the Montefiore Park Neighborhood Association, which seeks to revitalize Hamilton Heights by transforming its park into a focal point of community life. We are pleased this evening to have Michael with us and look forward to having him share his expertise with us. Michael, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Nidia. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, uh, and thank you to Michelle and to Martin uh, for inviting me to uh, share this uh, wonderful opportunity of grant writing. Actually, it's going to be an orientation uh, for artists and small organizations. Much larger or organizations have uh, uh, development directors and have a full staff. And probably I'm not going to tell them anything they don't already know. But for the individual artists and for the small organizations, this is a kind of an exciting time. And if you wouldn't mind, if we can go to the slide presentation, I'll make, uh, here we go. And uh, first, a little introduction to myself. I think, uh, again, my name is Michael Palma. I am the executive director for Teatro Circula. We have a theater right down in the Lower East Side on East 4th Street. And uh, we will be presenting uh, a Life is a Dream this November 26th here at the theater. Uh, and so this is a wonderful opportunity for anybody to come down and see in-person live Spanish language theater. So next slide, please, uh, Michelle. Orientation for artists and small organizations, grant proposals in the post-pandemic world. Now, a lot has happened in, in since the uh, uh, pandemic and yep and there have been changes in in grant making and grant funding uh the post pandemic uh trend in grant making looks to level the playing field and create more access and equity in giving and this is uh, uh as a result not only of the uh pandemic but also the sort of uh, social reckoning that we we've, we've had in in our communities and in our nation um, there has been uh, what we've observed in the in the field increased opportunities and accessibilities to funds especially by government and foundations in response to the pandemic and the social reckoning uh, these grants are beginning to uh, deal with these issues and so uh, they're looking to fund uh, projects that address racism, equity, inclusion, and social justice. Uh, there is, uh, and this is where it becomes very interesting for us here in Northern Manhattan, for artists and small organization, there is a focus uh, by funders, uh, a willingness to support smaller organizations and individual artists. Uh, and the individual artists will usually work through or, or, or with a conduit, hopefully with a small organization. And so this is a kind of an exciting time. This is really is a, a sort of paradigm shift uh, in the funding field. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, grants now are being viewed as investments in, in the community uh, and in the nonprofit sec uh, sector. Um, so they're really looking to develop relationships with artists 
and with smaller organizations. Uh, and, for, and for the first time, there's also an increased focus on general operating support and a support for the individual artists. So what does this all mean for us all in Northern Manhattan? That means money is coming down the pike. And what I wanted to do with this presentation is really give the individual artists and the small organization an orientation as to how, how, how grant writing and grant a proposal, uh, uh, submitting a competitive proposal is gonna be like now uh, in this sort of present day situation. And one of the biggest changes that, that um, has occurred if Michelle, we can go to the next slide. Ah, but before we even get into that, what we're gonna go into is sort of the topics that we're going to uh, discuss today. And uh, one of the things that in the new paradigm shift, in this whole new way of, of uh, submitting your grants and proposals is uh, the fact that everything now has gone online. No longer are we going to be submitting proposals through email, through the mail. We're not going to submit our grants through email and support material through the mail. Everything has gone online. And so when this has happened, that it really puts the onus on the individual artists and the small organization to be prepared. And Time is of the answers. Time is not on your side. So preparedness will go a long way in submitting a, a competitive pro proposal. And to that end, we're, talk we're gonna look at what needs to be done in order to um, avail ourselves of these opportunities. You're gonna have to do research. Uh, you're gonna have to review the criteria and especially review how the new grant portals work for the, uh, the various funders. You're gonna have to collect a bevy of information uh, you're going to have to obviously write the grant and then submit it. And then we're going to follow up and follow through. So next, uh, Michelle. All right, who is leading uh, on the uh, these new trends in funding? And basically, they're coming from two sectors. They're, com they're coming from the government uh, sector and the foundation sector. Corporations are almost not exist, and they're, they're really lagging behind, unfortunately. Hopefully, they'll catch up pretty soon. But from the gov government sources, obviously there have been a lot of uh, funds coming down all the way from the federal government all the way down to the local arts councils. Um, with the NEA, you have the American Rescue Plan and there are many opportunities there to uh, apply for funds. And you have the uh, New York State Council on the Arts at the state level with their five cultural opportunities and they've had quite a few for individual artists. Uh, the New York, State, uh, New York City Department of Libraries and Cultural Affairs is uh, also providing opportunities for individual artists and organizations. Uh, the Mayor's Artist Court Initiative, many, many of you have probably taken advantage of this uh, grant opportunity. They, they, they recently were giving out $5,000 grants uh, directly to individual artists, and most had their uh, projects performed uh, by the end of October, just this past month. Obviously, the Manhattan Borough President, for us in Upper Manhattan, uh, the Manhattan Borough Presidents will have their own initiatives for grant funding. Uh, obviously, the New York City Council on the Arts have their initiatives. They have the Cultural Immigrant Initiative. That's what the CII stands for there. Uh, they have CASA, SUCASA, and uh, CCNSF grants for those small organizations looking to build their capacity. Also, city council members have discretionary funding. Uh, most of them give through these various initiatives, but I still believe they have their own sort of pocket of money that they can still uh, dish out to small organizations and individual artists. And then you have the sort of small local arts councils. So for example, I'm not sure if NOMA is giving uh, grants out or maybe they will be in the future, but certainly uh, the Harlem Arts Alliance is, uh, and there is a new, uh, Arts Alliance organization being formed right now called the West Harlem Arts Alliance that's looking to that will look to give out grants to artists and small uh, uh, organizations and of course the Lower Manhattan Cultural Co Council who is taking up the grant giving uh, uh, chores uh, uh, through um, from the uh, uh, Upper Manhattan Empowerment Zone. So all of these are, are are opportunities that are have been. Uh, uh, 
accessible to artists, uh, to organizations in this neighborhood, but also there's going to be a, a, an increased effort to make these funds available to individual artists applying with uh, smaller organizations. Uh, on the foundation side, and this is where it gets to be kind of exciting, uh, there is a movement afoot on the foundation side. Um, uh, various initiatives are, are beginning to uh, form. Uh, they are um, various initiatives, sort of loosely named trust-based funding, where they collaborate with grantees to come up with a, a grant program that involves and uh, includes their input into grant making. And one of the companies, one of the foundations leading uh, the charge in this, although there's more facilitating uh, this effort is the New York Community Trust Mosaic Initiative. And that is to build and demonstrate a trust-based culture with grantees. Uh, again, uh, it is an investment in community leadership and capacity building and it opens up decision-making and information sharing structures in grant making. What does that mean? It's, it's, it's an exciting moment where funds, uh, they are collecting funds from different sources and they are going to be redistributing those funds to smaller organizations, to individual artists. This is what has been uh, uh, articulated as the need is for our community, communities of color. And so this is a sort of exciting time for us. And so. What does that mean for everyone in the audience today? Um, for those who uh, are looking, uh, you, you, you have to sort of do your research. Uh, the information is out there. It's, it's not out there. Uh, in many in instances, it is out there, especially with government sources. But with respect to foundations, it's going to be out there in the next, I think, few months. Uh, and I think they're going to start their grant programs in January, February, March. So I think you really have to keep, do your research. You have to keep your ears to the ground, go to these websites, get your name on listservs, uh, check out uh, uh, newsletters, uh, websites, uh, do your research online. Um, and as soon as they announce these grant programs, you can be uh, ready to then uh, go to the next slide, which is read carefully those guidelines that are coming down the pike. The good news is sort of, is that these applications will be online. And even though they are designed to be less complicated, simpler doesn't always mean easier. And so what I'd like to talk with you today is to give you some sort of idea of what's coming down and how how best to sort of approach these grants. They're, they're really designed to uh, be simpler a process. Uh, there isn't a lot of, uh, not as before, a lot of text required, but sometimes that's even harder, right? You, they're only gonna give you so many characters to bring your project across and you're gonna have to really, really get exact with, with your narrative. And so, uh, Hope the, the these grants will be available starting, I believe, in the in the new year. But as soon as they come out, the clock begins ticking, right? And you'll need to you want to review very, very carefully not only the grant guidelines, the how their portal works, uh, but you want to be able to re review the whole whole process. And honestly, that's going to take four to six weeks. Don't think you can submit these grants two weeks before and get it in and submit a competitive grant. It's gonna be very, very, very difficult. Uh, once you begin to review what those criteria are, you want to be able to align your project goals and objectives, objectives with those of the funders and their priorities and cri uh, criteria. Read and reread grant application guidelines very carefully, especially the eligibility requir requirements and, and, and especially the, their areas of focus. Know and understand the process of application. Again, these grant portals, and now they're using grant portals like Flux. Uh, some are even using SurveyMonkey, Submittable. Uh, these are all sort of various CRM type uh, cloud-based systems where you can put in your application, but you're gonna to have to learn how those portals work. And uh, it's, it's just gonna take some time to go through it and understand that process. Um, uh, know and understand the process of application, 
uh, request, request restrictions, the amount you can ask for, the minimum, the mass, maximum, and if there's any match, these guidelines will have critical dates. Yeah, obviously your deadline dates, uh, but they will also have uh, dates where you can attend webinars, um, uh, uh, what they call sometimes uh, um, uh, sessions where you can speak directly to the funders. Um, so understand what those dates are, uh, read and understand what the required documents are going to be and whatever other collateral material they're going to ask of you. Uh, read each question and, and understand exactly what's being asked. Now, uh, the process is, these processes are going to be a little simpler. Uh, and I think typically they're going to ask fewer questions. And sometimes these questions are going to seem like you can probably put the same answer in the same box, but uh, I think you're going to have to take the time, read the questions carefully and really be, uh, try to understand what is being asked of you for that particular question. And of course, ten, uh, you can always attend their webinars, call the funders, call your colleagues, call your fellow artists, uh, and uh, you can also review past recipients from, from the funder to get an idea of what they fund. Michelle, the next. Uh, all right, so before uh, diving into the contemplative effort of writing, I think it's a good idea to get all the perfunctory busy work out of the way. And, and that means that for or organizations as well as artists, there will be a bevy of documents and collateral materials that you're going to need to obtain and, and, and submit. Uh, for organizations, uh, and, and many organizations are, are, are familiar with some of these documents, uh, your informational filings like your 990, your Char 500, any audits or management reviews. If you're a small organization, you probably won't have independent audits, you'll have management reviews. Uh, for artists, you'll need resumes and CVs, uh, photos of your work, um, perhaps even letters of support, your, a listing of your past works, uh, links to work products, uh, either online, uh, on, on social media. And there may be other forms that, that will require you uh, for them to be notarized or to obtain them from other companies. Uh, it is a good idea that all this type of information, uh, you should begin at this point to digitize all that uh, into PDFs files. By and large, you're going to have to upload these documents. And in some cases, funders will require to put them all in one big uh, PDF file. And there are many online uh, resources where you can do that. But I think that this is a good time to sort of collect all your information. You don't want to be collecting this information and at the same time be writing your grant. Uh, you want to get this sort of out of the way, do this first, get, understand very clearly what all the documents are they're going to require, get it all digitized, organize it in your computer so that when it comes time to upload them, it's all sort of in the right order and you can just upload them uh, uh, when it comes time to submit your grant. This is something not very easy to do at the last minute. And like I said, some of these documents will require uh, time. In, in more cases, uh, it will require you to get the information from somebody else. Uh, if you're an individual artist and you're submitting with uh, an, another nonprofit, they will have to provide these documents for you. And so you'll have to ask for them. And sometimes, you know, you're not a, a big priority for them. And, you know, sometimes that takes time. So this is uh, one of the first things you should do when you uh, begin the process of putting in your grant proposals is getting this sort of busy work out of the way so that you can focus really on that contemplative time of your grant proposal in just writing. So uh, Michelle, the next. Uh, ah. Now this is going to be um, what I consider sort of my advice on how to approach the writing aspect of it. And <laughs> I don't know if anybody remembers the old dragnet, uh, just the facts, ma'am, just the facts. Uh, the, the new sort of paradigm shift in, in grant proposal submitting is that they're giving you less and less 
uh, character space to write about your project or program. And you're really going to have to be almost very perfunctory about it. Um, uh, but before you get into that uh, aspect of writing, one of the things that I personally like to do is to do the budget first. And I, I, that for me, uh, the budget is um, a way of understanding uh, the methodology of your project because all the sort of nuts and bolts of the project have to be paid for, right? And I think by doing the budget first, you begin to understand those nuts and bolts of your project and you'll begin to collect information uh, about your project that you can then put into your narrative. There is nothing worse than having, to, having your, your narrative written exactly 1,500 characters, then take a look at the budget and realize there's a whole aspect of this budget that you didn't even talk about. And now you have no more characters using your narrative and you're going to have to rewrite the whole thing. So what I suggest always is uh, as an exercise in, in really trying to understand the, the, the methodology of your, uh, of, your, of your project is do the budget first. And, and also by doing the budget, you also get to know, you may ask some questions or you may have uh, some considerations uh, or reconsiderations about the project that may come up based on, on what the budget is that will impact your narrative. I would highly recommend that you do not initially answer questions on the grant portal. Again, remember everything is being done online and um, I would highly recommend that, and most funders will give you an opportunity to uh, copy the questions or they'll have another document that you can download where you can copy the questions and put it in a Word document or a Google doc and answer your questions right there on, on the uh, Word document or the Google doc. Google doc is great because then you can share your narrative with other colleagues, with other members of the development team and uh, that they can have direct input into your writing. Uh, but it is very, very difficult to write creatively directly into the grant portal. Uh, so I highly recommend that you first copy all the questions that, uh, in, 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 that is asked in the uh, grant and then put your answers in that Word document. And then when the time comes, when you get just the right uh, uh, amount of characters in there to copy it and paste it and put it in the portal. Be exact in your answers, again, you, you're, you don't have uh, an endless amount of space to make your responses. And so you almost have to be a little perfunctory in, in, in what you're writing about. Uh, align, learn, and use the language, data, lingo, and terms associated with, associated with your project and, and more than likely what the funder is just expected to, to um, hear about the particular issue. So for example, if uh, you're talking about uh, uh, projects that have to deal with accessibility uh, to the arts, you'll want to use that, those languages and terms that, that speak to accessibility. Um, be very uh, careful of using past narratives. Uh, there is a tendency to copy and paste from other grants and to plop them into these boxes. And even though I think that serves as a good guide in responding to, to questions, you should always, always, always read what you're copying and pasting and tailor it specifically to this uh, funder and to answer that particular question. Uh, simply do not just copy and paste and think that, oh, I, I, I'm done with that answer. Uh, when it comes down, down to writing sort of the more uh, weighty parts of, uh, of, of your grant, uh, and, and remember you're giving yourself between four to six weeks to, to do this, I would, uh, one of the techniques that I like using is I like to break down the narratives into small chunks and answer those questions, you know, take, take a whole day just to work out the, the sort of quest, uh, the answer to those questions. Uh, one day at a time and then move on to another question. 
And then when I have all my sort of narrative together, then see how everything fits together. Of course, you'll have to edit it down in order to make it fit into, into the number of characters uh, allowed in that box. Uh, but I, I, so for me as a writer, it's always more, um, it's easier when you sort of break things down to smaller chunks and, and you answer um, the, the, the questions. Uh, you know, sometimes a question will have three questions in one. And so you'll try to you know, answer those questions individually uh, in small chunks and then the next day answer the next question so on and so forth. Again, you're giving yourself time to write and then to review and then to edit your narrative. Uh, you're not going to have space to be preachy, whiny, braggy, or redundant. There's just no space for that. You're just going to have to be right on point with all your narrative. Um, and, and if you get into a, a write a sentence and, and you ask yourself, well, is this adding or detracting to my argument in, in answering this uh, particular question? And if it's not adding anything, just take it out. If it's not really making the point, just take it out. Uh, it's important to make your case, make your point, and move on. And always stylistically, uh, and because you, you don't have that many characters, it's uh, always essential to keep uh, the language simple and direct. And I would refrain from using complex compound sentences. Uh, and those are, uh, they tend to be run-on sentences, uh, what happens is that uh, the reader of the grant, whether it be a panelist or the funder himself or herself, they'll get lost. And if you introduce one uh, or more or two or three uh, concepts in a sentence, it, it tends to distract and take away from the, the, the whole point that you're making in, in answering the question. So keeping the language simple, keeping uh, uh, the sentences, sentences punchy, uh, will go a long way in, in, in bringing your point across. And I know this is probably uh, goes without saying, but most importantly, make sure you answer the question. I cannot tell you how many times I sit on a, on a panel and I'm looking at responses to, to uh, questions that in no way, shape or form answers the question. And typically, I, I can't. It's it's hard to believe that this this happens. And I and I guess those are one of those moments when, when 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 the applicant just uh, copy and paste it and thought they were answering the questions, but they just put in there and they didn't review what they were were actually putting in in the box. But I cannot tell you how many times, or to put it in another way, how much more money the applicant would have gotten if they just simply answered the question. And sometimes it, it's, it, it's the, that may not be so obvious to the writer. And in which case I would say, uh, talk to a fellow artist, talk to a friend, uh, let them read the question and let them read your answer and see if, if in fact what you wrote uh, is answering the question. But I, I feel that where narratives fail other than uh, stylistically or grammatically um, is when they more importantly fail to answer the question and they talk about something totally different. They just go off on, on, on some other tangent. Um, remember that the new paradigm in, in the process of putting in your application is less questions and less space to write. So you really have to focus on what that question is and you really have to focus your uh, answer to uh, your narrative to answer that question. For, for many, you know, it's, uh, um, I, I always tend to overwrite and then I edit down. Uh, and that may work for some people, but I, I would say that for me, the sort of new way of, 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 of grant writing and putting in uh, the narrative is, is, is kind of interesting and it really forces you to think about what's important about your project, what's, what's important to say about your project um, and making sure that what you say about your project aligns itself with the priorities of the funder. 
And really, sometimes that really doesn't take that much space, you know. Uh, Michelle, the next. Um, okay, then uh, we get to the budget. Now, remember that uh, this is the step that I recommend doing first. And what is the budget? The budget is your narrative, but in number form, right? It is just another language. It's exactly what you wrote in, in words and letters and thoughts and sentences and paragraphs, but in, in number form. And you always have to make sure that your not narrative uh, aligns with and complements uh, the budget and that they make sense. You really can't have elements or, or um, parts of your project appear in the budget that don't really appear in your narrative. And that's why I always suggest do the budget first, right? So this way you can reconcile any differences and you don't have to spend too much time rewriting your narrative to make sure it aligns with your budget. You would have you would have already thought through the process and seen what uh, what's being paid for. Uh, ostensibly, the budget is, in these uh, new and the, the sort of new uh, uh, um, grant portals are are again very simple. They're going to have to be very direct. Um, they deal with expenses, personnel, and that's usually divided into personnel and other than personnel. Um, they sometimes do give you a chance to put in some overhead ad, uh, administrative expense. If it's smaller grants, maybe less so, but I always recommend to keep that amount to about 10% or less than the total project costs. I think that with these funding opportunities and with the priorities of funders, they really want to see the mon money going into the project and having that project impact the community and not necessarily pay for overhead. Although there will be opportunities to apply for general operating support. In which case we're talking about your organization as a whole and, and that's always a, a, a godsend. On the revenue side, uh, if there is a matching requirement for, for your uh, a grant, uh, they're going to wanna see that listed there. Um, as well as uh, any other uh, sources of income. And you may even have projected earned revenue for the project. A lot of grants don't, but some, uh, a lot of projects don't, but uh, your project may have some earned revenue. Um, I would say that uh, you have to keep in mind that when you receive grants that uh, require a one-to-one -one match or any other matching funds, remember that uh, you, uh, the, you may apply for a grant for $10,000. Well, if, if there's a match required, just know that the minimum the project will have to be is $20,000, right? Because you have to match that 10 with another 10 to, to come up with the project cost of $20,000. So always keep that in mind, be mindful of those types of requirements uh, in, your, in, in, in the uh, 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 funders requirements. Um, and they're gonna wanna see that that information is clearly stated in the budget. And of course, uh, any, any sort of uh, gross line items, uh, any amounts that you put in your sort of either on the expense side or on the income side uh, that represent gross figures, you're gonna want to explain them in the budget narrative. For example, if you put foundation income of $10,000, they're, they're gonna wanna know who that is. And if that's just one grant or maybe a series of small grants, you're gonna to have to explain any uh, line item in the budget. Uh, and sometimes the best way to do that is just to spell, just to calculate out exactly how you came up with that number. They, they're gonna to wanna to see and, and know that you understand the, the budget and how it and how it's going to, and, and that it's going to be able, you're gonna be able to do the, uh, the project for, for the, uh, uh, the money that you're, that you're gonna spend. Michelle, the next. Uh, uh, with the proposal itself, uh, uh, um, these are sort of the areas uh, in which they're going to want to, uh, these are sort of the, the categories they're gonna uh, want to understand about your particular project. Uh, you're going to have to provide a summary of your project. Typically they use this to, for publicity purposes, to, you know, to list uh, or to, 
represent what your proposal is on other documents, uh, 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 for example, a listing of, uh, of awarded grants so that they can just copy and paste very uh, neatly the summary of your project in those in, in those uh, 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 areas of their of their uh, marketing or, or publicizing of awards. And usually that's just about a couple of sentences, right? Uh, they're going to want to have a, a background information in the case of an artist, the, the, the background of the artist or the organization. Um, and their qualifications to carry out the project. Uh, most are going to want to uh, have uh, the the artist or the the organization put in a need statement, which clearly states the challenges to be solved uh, by the proposed project. And I believe that for Northern Manhattan or in Upper Manhattan. Uh, you're going to want to describe the target population, especially uh, uh, in North Manhattan. You have to describe in detail who you are helping uh, with this project. Um, uh, the project design and this area here, project design, which can be any one of the following goals, objectives, methods, outcomes, and evaluations. We can do a whole day just on that um, uh, workshop, just on that uh, sort of section alone. And this is where it does get a little bit complicated, uh, knowing the differences between goals, objectives, methods, outcomes, and, and your ability to evaluate the project. Um, but uh, that would be a uh, <laughs> subject for another workshop. But these are these are very uh, these are typically uh, what funders are going to want to know about your project. And again, what you're going to want to do is align these goals, objectives, methods, outcomes, and evaluations based on the funders' uh, priorities and their criteria for, for funding. You're also going to want to know, and remember uh, what I said before, now the, the funders are, are viewing these grants as investments. This is what we're, what, what's actually going to happen is that we're going to start having relationships with uh, funding relationships with these funders and, 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 and uh, uh, folks uh, in sort of the government programs where these are not going to be one-off uh, projects, right? They're investing in you, the artists, they're investing in the organization. And so they're going to want to know what, this is a wonderful project, what happens after this year? And, and you should write, put in something uh, that addresses that because you want to be able to have future funding for the, for the, for the project. And of course, you'll have your conclusion, uh, which again summarizes uh, some of the main points of your proposal. And then uh, more often than not, they will ask uh, for a project timeline. Uh, this is so that they, they, they want to understand that you know exactly how to implement the project. And they want to be able to see that you, that you can uh, get it done sort of in a timely fashion in whatever time uh, the grant specifies. Michelle, the next uh, uh, submitting your grant in the grant portal. Do not wait for the last minute to submit your grant application online. I, I think, I don't know if anybody has had the experience of waiting until the last minute to say, you've done all of this work, you've done your budget, you've collected all your information, you've written this beautiful prose to uh, uh, describe your project. And when you get to the portal to and you copy and paste it and put it and upload everything into the portal. And if you're right there at the grant deadline and you hit submit, and all you see is that sort of round little circle going around and round and round and round, or in, in the Apple world, that sort of a balloon that just goes round and round and round and round. And guess what? If it's not submitted by the deadline, it's, it won't be submitted at all. Uh, there will be a mad rush at the end by many to upload their application. And what happens is that things will get just clogged up. And uh, it, it one time, and it'll just block you out. This happened to me once where my grant actually was uh, uh, entered one minute after the deadline. I'm not sure why I waited that long for that particular grant, but I did. And it was submitted one minute after the deadline. It was not accepted. Uh, I, I think you're, you're going to uh, 
you have four to six weeks, remember to submit these grants. And I would say, get it in maybe anywhere between four to seven days before the deadline. You'll, you have the time to do that. Uh, again, uh, understand how each grant portal works. They all sort of work a little differently. Uh, obviously the login procedures, the loading up of files and entering text into those boxes. You have to, uh, um, some grant portals, you can hit the save but button and it'll save. Others saves as you go, others won't save. And it'll let you go to the next page and not save. And so you have to be very mindful that as you're going along, copying and pasting your answer from, from, from your Word document or Google Doc, and you're putting it in those boxes that you're hitting save every time you're doing that. Uh, make sure that you uh, you've attached all your documents, typically in these new portals. They will not let you proceed or submit a, a, a proposal unless all the documents are uploaded. And, and just be mindful to clearly identify those documents that you've saved, digitized and saved in your computer so that when you go to upload them, you're uploading the correct document. Uh, uh, reconcile any incomplete sections. Uh, sometimes uh, when you write your narrative in Word document and you copy and paste it into the, um, uh, the portal, uh, for some reason, uh, Word has more characters in, in than what the portal will actually allow. And I'm not exactly sure why that is, uh, but you have to be very careful that as you copy and paste and put information from the Word document into the portal that it didn't truncate or cut off your last sentence. And so you always have to take a look and reread. And then you may even have to edit that down a little bit more to make it fit. Okay, so uh, most of these portals will allow you to uh, make a draft copy of your application. And I highly recommend you do that so that you can now, you remember, you have a little time, right? You have two or three, uh, four to seven days to submit, right? So you have time after you put everything in there to print out your application and read it. You're going to read it more or less the same way the panelists are going to read it. And so you just want to make sure that in the transferring of information from your Word document, from your budget, uh, from all the different digitized documents that you uploaded, you want to make sure that it reads well uh, from top to finish, right? From top to bottom. And most of these portals will give you an opportunity to do that. Uh, so now once you've got everything in, you can then finally hit your submit button and then uh, they will give you also then give you the opportunity to print your final uh, submission. And it's very, very important to have a copy of that final submission. Uh, because it, it may be that the funders may call you on it later on. They, they may have a, a question about something, or maybe you missed, it didn't reconcile, reconcile something, and, they, and they'll, they'll call you to sort of get a little clarification. And you, you're going to want to be able to see what they see in order to fix it. So always uh, retain a copy. And then also, uh, as much as you can, uh, most of these portals will set, submit a or send you an email that you, uh, a confirmation email that you've submitted your grant. But more importantly, if they if they don't do that, then just take a take your phone and take a screenshot of your uh, of your you've success, successfully submitted your application. Just take a screenshot of your of your monitor, just so that you have confirmation that it was submitted. I can't tell you how many uh, applicants did exactly that. And for some reason, it didn't get to the the, the grant uh, uh, the, the funder, but because they had that confirmation and because they had that picture of the screen screenshot, the funder was able to open up the portal and let them uh, sub finish submitting their application. Snafus happen, and so that's always very important. Okay, lastly, now it's uh, again as uh, Serena Williams will tell you. In order to hit that ace, the most important aspect of hitting the ace is, is the follow up, right? Thank funders, collaborators, and other supporters in helping uh, you submit the grants. Just the classy thing to do, guys, right? Usually, putting in a grant is a team effort, 
And after you submit it, uh, especially if you're an individual artist and, and you're uh, applying through a conduit, a small nonprofit organization, thank them. Uh, again, make sure you have an exact copy of your submission in case they do call you. Uh, and then afterwards, always check your spam promotion and junk mail folders, just in, just in case you get an email notification from the funder. And I can't tell you how many times this has happened to me and to many of my colleagues where they submit something and then they do make a, a send either a, a email confirmation or a request for more information, or even in some cases, an award, an, e an, an award email, but it goes to their spam promotion or junk email folder. And I can't tell you how many times that has happened. As a matter of fact, most portals will ask you, uh, more sophisticated portals will ask you to please uh, uh, check your uh, spam promotion or junk emails or, or have a way for that not to go there. And they'll tell you sort of how to do that. But some of the more less sophisticated ones, and, and believe it or not, some organizations use SurveyMonkey to, to make out a grant applications. Uh, are, are not quite as sophisticated. So they will send notices out uh, and by and large, sometimes it will go to that spam promotion and junk email, check it regularly. Of course, if you're awarded, write your thank you letter, review the grant agreement and note critical dates for interim reports, uh, request for funds and final reports. Uh, keep your funder informed about your project, especially if there are any material changes to it. Do not go to the funder in your final report and submit uh, uh, and tell them that something changed dramatically with your project. Uh, they're not going to want to hear that at the uh, in the final report. In your interim report, yes, or in time before or after your interim report, as it happens, it's always uh, good to inform the funders of any changes to your project, especially if they represent a material change, a very big change. And of course, if it's not, if you're not awarded, keep in touch with your funder anyway. This whole process is all about relationship building. And remember that I said at the beginning that funders are looking to invest in individual artists, they're looking to invest into organizations. And if you don't get funded, you wanna be able to uh, keep that relationship going, uh, keep that uh, uh, sort of conversation going with the funders and who knows next year, you may get awarded. So I think that's the end of my uh, pre uh, presentation. It's been about 46 minutes so far. Uh, now I think we can go straight into the Q&A. Iria or Michelle? Yeah, I think there might be some questions already in the chat. Before, before we get to questions, I just wanna say that was, that was so great. <laughs> so rich with so many, um, you know, small details, big details, big picture, um, and context, which was, I really appreciated. Um, and I think, you know, for those of us who have written grants before, we've all made one or more of those mistakes. Um, so it's always nice to be reminded about um, the, 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 the approach to doing that. So thank you so much for that. It was really, really uh, enlightening. Um, I think we have some questions here. So I want to um, have, uh, I think, Kathy O'Keefe, I think you, you kicked off some of the questions. Kathy, did you want to ask a question? Uh, sure. The first question I had was, what are some examples of foundations that may be opening up calls for grants early next year? Where would we go about looking for such foundations? Well, there are some very, uh, <clears throat> I think there are sort of uh, listservs or you can subscribe to uh, um, uh, newsletters like Hyperallergic. Um, there is sort of a bevy, a bevy of, of, of newsletters that go out. The New York Foundation for the Arts, NIFA, uh, uh, constantly uh, uh, publishes uh, th this type of information on a regular basis. You may want to put your your email address on their on their newsletter list. Um, one of the the most exciting um, efforts is being handled right now or facilitated by the New York Community Trust. 
Uh, they're doing something called participatory uh, grant making where grantees are, are being involved in the grant making process. That's kind of exciting because it, it's, from what I see, the emphasis is going to be on smaller organizations and individual artists. And uh, I think what they're trying to do, as I mentioned, is to sort of level the playing field and provide these grant opportunities to smaller organizations, to individual artists, and especially uh, for those projects uh, that deal with, uh, you know, diversity, inclusion, and social justice. Uh, and invariably those projects uh, deal with um, working very closely with a community. So it's going to be, even though it's a uh, artist space, it's going to be artists working in the community. I would keep my ear to the ground on, uh, on, you know, from those sources and with this particular initiative by the New York Community Trust, I think you should be hearing something very exciting in January or February as they sort of work through the, the grant making process with individual artists and with organizations, with people, talking to people in the funding world and figuring out the, an equitable way of distributing. I think they have about $8 million uh, to distribute. I think they're gonna try to reserve fund to keep that sort of program going you know, for ensuing years. So uh, this is very, very exciting. It's very, very exciting for us in Northern Manhattan. And uh, this is the sort of research part that you have to do. This is, this is the time that you have to invest in, in, in looking out for, for that information. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's the whole part of this, this effort is just keeping your ear to the ground. Um, uh, maybe Noma, will, I don't know if Noma puts out a, a newsletter, uh, about yes. uh, grant opportunities. So obviously I would subscribe and become a member of Noma in order to get information, but also there are many other organizations out there that do the same thing. Oh, great. Thank you very much. Um, I did have one other question about the budgeting. Um, where do you cover your art supplies and or a studio space under overhead or OTPS? No, that would be OTPS, right? Especially OTPS. any, any yeah. expense that goes directly to the project would be OTPS. And also anybody that you pay, any personnel that goes directly to the project is, uh, uh, personnel services, um, or overhead. Uh, obviously, artists don't don't really have overhead. Now, overhead is an issue more for organiz organizations, and even then, uh, I would keep that to a minimum. Um, I, I can't tell you how many times, sitting as a panelist, I've seen people put into the overhead the exact amount of money they're requesting. So, as wow. <laughs> as a funder. <laughs> As a funder, you know, where is the money going? You know, is it going into the community? Is it going into the art form? Or is it going to pay this person who's running the program? The organization, rather. Thank you very much. Sure. Does anybody else have questions? You can raise your hand um, so that we can identify you and we can unmute you. Wow, <clears throat> I think um, it, it, it was uh, presentation was really an orientation for artists and small organizations, and I and I think that one of the biggest takeaways in 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 tonight's presentation is that there are going to be increased opportunities uh, for artists and small organizations in northern Manhattan, and. Uh, I think that this is an exciting time because ho hopefully this will also uh, address some of the inequities in, in the funding world, world towards smaller organizations and, and artists, especially those who are BIPOC. And so this is, this is just very exciting. And I, I, and I, and I thank uh, Nidia and Martin and Michelle for giving me the opportunity to make this presentation. I, I hope that... Um, Everybody, the artists and organizations at, at least have a sort of a basic orientation about what's coming down the pike. The other big takeaway is that it's all online, you know, and if you find yourself that you're technically challenged, get someone to help you submit uh, your narrative and your documents online. Uh, 
the funders view this as a simpler way of doing it, but or, or less complicated way of doing it, but simpler is not always easier. And so you, you may need that help too. Yes, as someone who has seen that circle going round and round and round after you hit submit, um, I think <laughs> I think that's true. Um, I also, I mean, I appreciate the advice of um, doing all those logistical pieces first, you know, um, it, it makes a lot of sense and just sort of demystifying um, the proposal. I think sometimes it, it feels so daunting that, you know, um, you, you kind of want to push it to the side and, and think about the narrative, but the truth is it makes a lot of sense um, to get those pieces sort of in place first. And then the narrative sort of flows at that point. Um, sure. Does anybody else have another question here? Uh, Michael. I think Michael, yeah. How you doing? Um, just two things. Uh, first, I noticed that this is, um, Manhattan residents only because I live in the Bronx. Uh huh. Um, well, this is the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance, so I really try to focus on Northern Manhattan artists. Okay. But, but uh, I, I, the, the same is true for for artists in the Bronx, artists in Brooklyn, artists in Queens, and artists in Staten Island. Uh, th these initiatives. Uh, and I've listed government sources and the Mosaic Initiative by the New York Community Trust. And a lot of that is driven, about, uh, driven by a lot of what uh, the Ford Foundation and the Mellon Foundation are, are doing. Uh, the New York Community Trust collects these funds from different sources and, and they sort of facilitate this. It's going to be citywide. It's going to be citywide. It's not uh, strictly for Northern Manhattan. So yes, if you're in the Bronx and, and your project is, is in the Bronx, you you will be you'll be you'll have access to those opportunities as well. And my other my other statement really was I've had issues sometimes in the past where you upload documents, but there's like a megabyte limit. I don't yeah. know if anybody else experiences that. How, how do you get around that? Well, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, and I think this is a good exercise to do is to digitize all your documents. Um, and when you do, in other words, make them into PDF files. And uh, if you work with uh, a Adobe PDF, and if you don't, there are other sort of online resources where you don't have to pay for Adobe. You can, you can sort of download a free version of something else that does the same thing. You can reduce the size of your PDF files. Uh, by some sort of compression algorithm. So something that, for example, is 36 megabytes, it'll come down to like five or six megabytes. And so that's how I would go, go get around that. I think uh, PDF files are great, you know, for that. Uh, you can compress them seven ways from Sundays and the quality will still be the same. Um, and so I, I would, you know, as much as I can, try to get all of your documents, all your assets, all your collateral, mater collateral material, whether they be photos or just a perfunctory list of links of where people can click on and, and, and see your site, either in Venmo or YouTube, and just put it all in, in, in PDF files. And this way you can you know, pick and choose what you, what you need for a particular grant. Thanks. Yeah. That's great. I think we have another question from Dee. Dee, I, you're, you have a, a great question here about budgets. Can Would you like to ask? Sure. Hi, Michael. Thank you so much for this. You are so clear. I, I think you. I'm excited to sit down and uh, <laughs> do some contemplative writing. Yeah. <laughs> Can you just clarify what you consider to be a small org? Um, Budget-wise, what is that? Under sure. 500,000? Sure. I, I think um, a lot of the, uh, the <clears throat> a lot of the funding uh, a lot of this is is sort of uh, done by how the sort of IRS views your requirement to submit an audit as opposed to a, 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 a management review, right? So I think currently right now organizations that have to do an independent audit are those organizations that are, I believe the threshold now is $800,000 or more. It used to be $500,000. I think they recently increased to $800,000. So certainly any organization 
the, and the fund just take that as a guide, right? So any organizations less than a million, it, they probably would consider a small organizations or uh, an organization of, uh, that can have access to th this money for this funds. In other words, uh, the funds that are going to be available. Um, organizations that are a million or more won't have access to this funds and won't be able to apply. But organizations that are, tend to be a million or less, or it could be 800,000 or less, or it could even go down as 500,000 or less. Also, uh, they, they may, and this is what they're working on right now, is that depending on your organization size, you can ask for a certain amount of money, right? That threshold tends to be from uh, $150,000 to $250,000, $250,000 to $500,000, and then $500,000 to a million dollars. So usually sometimes they, they sort of stratify the, the amount of money you can get based on your operating budget. And sometimes it's either based on your current operating budget or your most recently filed 990. All organizations have to file a 990, but not all organizations have to have independent audits. They can have management reviews or sort of uh, a report uh, written by, uh, say for example, the board treasurer that testifies to the veracity of the numbers of the organization and that it accompanies the 990, your informational filing. Uh, but that's what they use and, and by and large, um, well, that's what it is. Uh, less than a million, but it could be less than eight hundred thousand. It could be less than five hundred thousand. It all depends on, on on what the funder considers small. But that's the world we're talking about, basically. A million dollars or more is probably going to be considered a large organization. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Great question. Um, any other questions? Okay, we I know that I know that often, um, the, you know, the, the questions are, are very specific to one's own kind of, you know, projects or circumstances. Um, and so we've actually, um, I are raffling off for um, 15 minute one on one sessions of with Michael who's graciously agreed um, to do that uh, for us so I'm going to turn this over to um, Michelle, who I think is actually coordinating this raffle for the evening so Michelle what you want to sort of uh, spread the good news. Uh, yes, I in the chat um, asked Nuria to randomly pick four numbers and. Um, Thank you for showing up tonight. You are, if you're one of the lucky winners, um, we have Clara, Emily, Jason, and Michael um, are the four lucky winners. So we will, um, Michael uh, will be contacting you and you can have your 15 minute private consultation with him. And as you can, I'm sure tell by now he's very helpful. So um, that should be a great, yeah. um, <laughs> great uh, advancement to your grant writing. Yeah, and it won't be a hard 15, you know, it'll be, it'll, it'll be what it has to be, right? Thank you, Michael. Um, and you know, and if you find that you know you you sort of um, feel good about where you are and you want to sort of you know pass it along uh, to someone else, you know, we we can certainly we can do that as well. Uh, but this is just a nice opportunity to to be able to get go from some some of the more general pieces to the more specific. Um, I think Gabe actually has a question now. Gabe, would you like to ask your question? Yes, uh, this, uh, thank you so much for this uh, excellent workshop. My questions are really unrelated to um, this workshop. Uh, I sent Michael a direct message and I was wondering if he was able to get it because <laughs> um, I was recently appointed to CB9 and I was trying to reach him. Well, yeah, the, my email address is uh, palmamir, P-A-L-M-A-M-I-R at gmail.com if you want i'll put that in the can i put it in the chat yeah sure that'd be great and uh and i'm also going to put my phone number and anybody who has a question 
that, that maybe they can't think of now and want to shoot me an email or give me a call, I'm, I'll be happy to answer any questions, uh, any brief questions. Um, and uh, what's your name? I'm sorry. Gabe, Gabe Morales. Gabe, Gabe Morales. Uh, great, fantastic, wonderful. Yeah, give Thank me a call anytime. Okay. Sure. Chévere. Gracias. That's excellent. Gracias a ti. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, we, well, before I turn it over to Martin, who will sort of close out the evening with some announcements, I wanted um, first to uh, thank Michael um, for sharing his expertise. Um, I think the clarity of your presentation um, and the uh, richness of your content really um, made this really wonderful um, workshop. So we thank you so much uh, for, for being such a great resource to all of us. Um, thank you. And thank you to all of you for being here tonight, uh, for sharing um, your Monday evening with us. We're always happy to have you here. Um, and and uh, so we hope to see you again at our next workshops and I will let Martin fill you in on those. Martin. Thank you, Daria. We invite everyone to uh, join us at these upcoming workshops by the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance, Best Practices for Artists websites by Patricia Miranda at 6 p.m. Monday, December 6th. Also producing and editing a standout highlight reel with Emmanuel Abreu at 6.30 on Monday, December 13th. We also have two Heal with Noma workshops coming up in December, on Wednesday, December 1st at 12 noon, Collective Care Art, and on Friday, December 10th at 12 noon, Reflecting Back and Looking Forward. Please visit our website, nomanyc.org for details. Our very popular artist biography series, Thursdays with Noma, will resume at 7.30 p.m. on Thursday, December 2nd, with artists Takashi Harada and Kei Soto, and it will continue at 7.30 p.m. on Thursday, December 16th, with artist Jessica Mafia. Please see nomanyc.org for info. We invite you to read the Northern Manhattan Arts Alliance weekly newsletter filled with artists' opportunities, exhibitions, resources, events, and to calendar your own events all on our website, nomanyc.org. We wanna thank you everyone for joining us tonight and have a great evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.